Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Present. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I chair the committee that produces these broadcasts. Every year come February, Concerned Citizens honors Black History Month by inviting speakers on topics related to the African American experience. And this month is no exception. If you have been paying attention, you know that African American history tends to take two steps forward and one step back. The 14th Amendment, then Jim Crow the civil rights movement, then mass incarceration. Today, Concerned Citizens is pleased to have a speaker who is an expert on this paradoxical situation. Carl Mannheim received a bachelor's from Bradley University, a Juris Doctor from Northeastern, and a Master of Laws from Harvard. He is Professor Emeritus at the Loyola Marymount School of Law where he has taught constitutional law, among other subjects. Of special interest to our viewers, Professor Mannheim has spent years volunteering for the ACLU, under whose auspices he has litigated cases at courts as high as the California Supreme Court. Today, Professor Mannheim will talk to us about Civil Rights in America. Please join me in welcoming Carl Mannheim. Thank you, Suzanne. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, and I'm honored to be here today to share uh, and celebrate Black History Month uh, with uh, concerned citizens, uh, for sure. So I am going to uh, share my screen and um, then start a slideshow uh, so hopefully the technology of the 18th century uh, won't hold us back. Uh, here we go. Excellent, excellent. So I'm going to start our discussion of civil rights uh, with the Bill of Rights of 1791. Uh, as you may recall, the first Congress uh, sent out a total of 12 amendments to the states for ratification. Uh, 10 of them were adopted in 1791, and you're familiar with them, I presume. The First Amendment, which protects uh, religion, speech, press, assembly, and the right of petition. Uh, the Second Amendment, which protects, um, well, you know, guns. And the Third Amendment, uh, which is uh, often less appreciated, uh, is uh, pr protects our pri privacy in our own homes. The Fifth Amendment has a number of uh, pr provisions, two of which are of note, uh, the protection of property, unfortunately, including the uh, property in slaves, and the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, which uh, assures regularity in government action. The Ninth Amendment never used as a basis of rights uh, because it's too open-ended. It does remind us, however, that there are uh, rights other than those listed in the Bill of Rights. Um, the uh, other amendments, the fourth, sixth, and eighth primarily, uh, deal with uh, the rights of criminal defendants. And the 10th amendment, which you've probably heard about, is the state's rights amendment. In some respects, the antithesis of civil rights. Uh, so no discussion of civil rights um, is complete without uh, recognizing the role that slavery has played uh, in the American experiment. Uh, there was a New York Times uh, feature uh, last year, uh, or actually in, in uh, 2019, uh, called the 1619 Project, um, referencing the beginning of the importation of slaves uh, into uh, North America. Uh, of course, by 1619, there already had been a long history in Europe, including indentured servitude. So it was thought to be a, simply a continuation of longstanding practices, uh, albeit uh, one that focused on African slavery. 
so by the time the constitution comes around uh, to be both drafted and then ratified uh, in the late 18th century, uh, there was a, a great uh, deal of concern among the Southern states that their institution and their economic reliance on slavery uh, would be somehow affected uh, by the creation of a new constitution and a strong central government um, at that time in New York and now in, in Washington, DC. So there were a number of compromises made, uh, which some of which still haunt us today. Uh, the first of these great compromises was the notion that uh, each state in the union would have equal suffrage in the Senate. And that means Montana with its 800,000 residents has the same number of senators too, as California does with its 40 million uh, residents. So that gives, uh, and has, was intended to uh, give a disproportionate uh, power in the Senate uh, to the slave holding states. Uh, the slave holding states also got disproportionate representation in the house, uh, which is based on the, uh, the census or the number of people in each state. The slave holding states get extra representation based on the number of slaves they have. This is the infamous three fifths clause, often mistaken to think that slaves were only three fifths of a person. No, slaves were zero fifths of a person. The whites in those states had extra representation based on the number of slaves in those states. Um, the third element of this great compromise was the requirement for a supermajority, a very large supermajority, to make any constitutional amendment. Three quarters of the states, 38 states and the current count, that means 13 states, 13 small states, which comprise, let's say, 7% of the total US population, have a veto over any constitutional amendment. Uh, that may explain, for instance, why we haven't had a constitutional amendment uh, since 1972. Uh, now, you could say not much has changed in the United States in the last 50 years, uh, but then when it comes to civil rights, that may be true. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, there were two provisions in the original constitution that prohibited Congress from making any changes or any efforts to regulate slavery um, for the first 21 years of the nation. Um, they could not, uh, they could not uh, regulate the slave trade uh, and they could not pass a constitutional amendment. Well, despite the great compromise of 1787, the Southern states continued to object to power from Washington, from the central government. Um, they were most concerned during the entire first half of the 19th century uh, that Congress would use its power to uh, eliminate slavery or the slave trade. Um, and that fear was, um, I, I guess, abated uh, by the Supreme Court's decision in 1857, Dred Scott versus Sanford. Uh, that case, uh, probably one of the most uh, notorious cases in Supreme Court history, uh, did two things. Uh, it it um, invalidated the Missouri Compromise, by which Missouri was admitted as a slave state and all other states at the time would be admitted as free states. And invalidated that because there could not be free states. And the reason there could not be free states is that you could not deprive slave owners of their property and slaves. And blacks, whether slave or free, uh, were not entitled to be considered citizens uh, in the United States. So uh, um, now it's possible that uh, Chief Justice Roger Taney was trying to stave off a civil war in 1857, but to no avail. So the civil war or the war between the states was nominally fought over states' rights, but we all know what was really at stake. It was the maintenance of uh, slavery as an institution. Uh, what few of us know uh, or have studied is the Constitution of the Confederate States of America. Yes, they were they seceded from the Union, they were forming their own nation, they needed a constitution and they wrote one in 1861. It looked a lot like the federal constitution with some notable differences. One is it reinforced the notion of state sovereignty. Uh, and by doing so, it weakened the power of the central government, the central Confederate government. Uh, and it also um, reinforced the notion that slaves were property and that uh, no law impairing the, impairing the right of property and slaves uh, could be passed. Uh, that was the constitution of the Confederate States. Well, um, the, uh, the war wasn't going well uh, for the Confederacy. Uh, and so by 1863, um, President Lincoln uh, issues the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, this is often mistaken to uh, 
uh, in the belief that it uh, eliminated slavery. Well, it did, but only in the Southern states and only in those parts of the Southern states uh, that were under Confederate military control. Uh, parts of the state of those states that had uh, been occupied by the Union uh, Army uh, were not covered by the Emancipation uh, Proclamation. Uh, which was uh, justified as a military measure because slaves were providing material support to the Confederate Army. Well, um, we know about the Civil War, we know about the General Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse, uh, and uh, so from a military standpoint, the uh, Union wins the war. From a legal standpoint, it requires some constitutional amendments. The first of which is the 13th that abolishes slavery. Uh, and I want to note that this is the only provision in the entire US Constitution that applies to private action. Uh, the rest of the Constitution, whether it's in the Bill of Rights or the amendments or the original Constitution, only go to government action, whether federal or state, and do not restrain, let's say, you or me as private actors. The 13th Amendment does. Uh, we can't have slaves. Uh, the 14th Amendment uh, has four major provisions. There's the Birthright Citizenship Clause, uh, which uh, directly overrules um, the Dred Scott decision. Uh, there is the Privileges and Immunities Clause, uh, which gives uh, certain rights to US citizens, rights that would have to be defined by the Supreme Court. Uh, it has a Due Process Clause. Uh, remember, the Fifth Amendment had a Due Process Clause as well, but the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government. And this due process clause, and indeed the, entire, the entirety of the 14th Amendment, applies to state governments. And so now the rights that uh, citizens enjoyed against federal overreaching, federal abuse uh, abuses can now be enjoyed uh, against uh, state abuses as well. The equal protection clauses of uh, like nature, we'll talk more about that in a minute, uh, but also uh, it is uh, applicable against uh, state and local governments. Uh, the 15th Amendment, <clears throat> this is the third of the what we call the Civil War Amendments because they're in the wake of the Civil War, um, extends voting rights uh, to all persons irrespective of color or creed. So these amendments are really the origin of the notion of civil rights as we currently use the term. Uh, the rights that preexisted these, let's say in the Bill of Rights, we might think of those as civil liberties, uh, but civil rights and the civil rights movement is uh, uh, really premised on these three Civil War amendments. Uh, the 14th Amendment really is the centerpiece of this uh, because it interposes the federal government between states and their citizens. Uh, it's the first time that uh, American citizens could assert rights against the federal government, uh, against the state governments. Previously, they could only assert constitutional rights against the federal government and rights against uh, state abuses uh, would have to be based in state law or state constitutions, which in most cases were rather inadequate for the purpose. So it's based on these Civil War amendments that we get our first Civil Rights Acts. There's the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which bans the Black Codes. Um, the Southern states may have uh, lost the institution of slavery, but they tried to retain as much of the impediments on Blacks as they could through the Black Codes. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was passed on the basis of Congress's power in the 13th Amendment, Section 2. This is known as the Civil Rights Enforcement Power. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. And so that was the constitutional basis for uh, Congress, the Republicans in Congress in 1866, uh, passing this first Civil Rights Act. Well, Andrew Johnson, who you know, uh, seceded to the presidency after Lincoln was assassinated, vetoes the 1866 act. He says it's unconstitutional. It's not authorized by the 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment deals with slavery. The Civil Rights Act deals with civil rights. And those are not the same, right? It's fine for the states to uh, enact their black codes as long as they just don't try to reinstitute slavery per se. Well, <clears throat> Congress uh, uh, did three things. It, uh, in response to the, to the veto, it overrode it. So the Civil Rights Act actually becomes law. Uh, they impeached Johnson. Now there were some nominal or formal uh, uh, explanations for the impeachment and the articles of impeachment, but the, the, the real motivation was uh, this uh, vetoing of the 66 Act. 
And the third thing is they were worried that he might have been right as a constitutional matter uh, and that the 13th Amendment in slavery was not sufficient uh, to uh, pass uh, sweeping civil rights legislation. So Congress then proposes the 14th Amendment, which then gets ratified a few years later. Um, in the meantime, we have the Reconstruction Acts, 1867, 1868. Uh, as you know, Reconstruction uh, included the Union the army occupation of the Southern states, displacement of the Southern governments, Southern courts, uh, Southern administrations, uh, everything was run uh, through the Union army, including trials. Uh, they were all courts martial. Um, uh, there was another civil rights uh, statute. Uh, this one passed in 1871, uh, which had the affectionate name of the Ku Klux Klan Act. Uh, so the Ku Klux Klan, which arises in the wake of the, of the South's loss of the Civil War, uh, they uh, needed to be uh, reined in, obviously. And this is what the 1871 Act uh, tries to do. Its most important provision is now known as Section 1983. Uh, and this provides a cause of action against state officials for the violation of constitutional and statutory rights. Um, this is still actively used. We'll come back and talk about Section 1983 uh, later on. Uh, but these, all these laws are, are now passed pursuant to Congress's uh, new civil rights enforcement power, the ones in the 14th Amendment, as opposed to the ones first in the 13th Amendment, uh, and, uh, and which is probably the entire reason for the 14th Amendment. Um, all the acts get uh, uh, combined in one omnibus legislation in 1875, which codifies them all, also based on Congress's Section 5 power. Then there's the election of 1876. And as you can imagine, the principal issue was the Civil Rights Act and the, uh, uh, you know, the South's trying to restore or maintain white supremacy. Uh, and the, uh, uh, so that was the principal uh, a political issue, I think, in 1876. Uh, the election of 1876 was at the point, at that point, considered the, the closest in American history. The Democrat, Samuel Tilden, uh, won both the popular vote and the electoral college, uh, beating the Republican Rutherford B. Hayes. However, the Republicans challenged electors from Florida and two other states, whoever heard of that. Um, and uh, had uh, those three states been, if the electors, if the Hayes' electors were seated, then he would win the electoral college and become president. Uh, so that was the basis of that contest. Uh, I guess history repeats itself, doesn't it? Congress did what seemed to be a sensible thing. They appointed a commission uh, to resolve uh, the electoral dispute, uh, and they appointed five member, five Democrats and five Republicans to that commission. I guess no one expected them to split along party lines, and therefore they couldn't resolve the electoral challenges. And so Congress then did the next best thing. It added five members of the Supreme Court to essentially decide the election of 1876. I mean, why would the Supreme Court ever decide a presidential election? Who ever heard of that? Well, in any event, um, Justice Bradley on the Supreme Court uh, proposed the next great compromise in American history, and that is the Great Compromise of 1877. And what that compromise was, was that the Democrats, recall, um, the Republicans during the mid-19th century was, was the party of Lincoln. It was the party of civil rights. It was the Democrats, the Dixiecrats, that were the party of states' rights and Southern power. But the, nonetheless, the great compromise would be that the Democrats from the South uh, would agree to award the disputed electors to the Republican Hayes. Hayes would become president, in exchange for which the Republicans in Congress would dismantle reconstruction and repeal the civil rights laws, restoring to the Southern states their sovereignty and their ability to uh, discriminate uh, and, re and reimpose slavery, at least uh, as a functional matter. That was the Great Compromise of 1877. The, uh, <clears throat> the Democrats kept their end of the bargain and they, uh, they awarded the electoral votes to Hayes and he became president. The Republicans in Congress did not fully repeal the civil rights laws uh, or the Reconstruction Acts. So Bradley, who had been the architect of the Great Compromise, uh, fulfills it uh, in 1883 in a Supreme Court case called the Civil Rights Cases, ruling that the civil rights laws were unconstitutional. 
that they exceeded Congress's powers uh, under the 14th Amendment. And as a result, from 1883 for the next 80 years, there were no federal civil rights laws in this country. And in their absence, the states were completely free to uh, continue their black codes now under the nomination of uh, Jim Crow laws. And uh, we know what those were like, uh, such as the, the Louisiana law that mandated segregated rail cars upheld by the Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896. And as Justice Brown said in that case famously, if one race be inferior, inferior to the other, the constitution cannot put them on the same plane. Uh, that'll go down in infamy. Um, so we see a whoops. We see a total failure of Reconstruction and the Compromise of 1877, thanks to the Supreme Court, which has remained pretty much a fairly conservative force throughout the 19th and early 20th century, and now through the early 21st century. All right. Um, so the first movement we have towards restoring civil rights is in a series of um, uh, Supreme Court cases on segregation. Uh, so we know about Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. It was first argued during the 52 term and the Supreme Court uh, was unable to reach a decision. Uh, there was no consensus on the court. We had a new administration, uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower and the court wanted to get its opinion. Uh, and uh, we had a new chief justice, uh, Earl Warren, uh, who uh, you may remember as having, as uh, attorney general of California, having enforced the Japanese occlusion and internment orders. When Warren retired from the Supreme Court, he said the only thing he ever regretted in his public life was this, enforcing uh, the Japanese exclusion. This is a picture of Monroe Elementary School, fourth, um, I, I don't know what grade it is, but uh, there it is. Uh, there's Linda Brown, the nominal plaintiff in Brown versus Board of, Education, Board of Education in the back row, fourth on the right. Uh, the Supreme Court held that uh, segregation, segregated schools were unconstitutional. Uh, the original intent of the 14th Amendment was uh, un, uh, immaterial to that. The court gives us a new meaning of equality. It has to be more than superficial. Uh, any kind of separation promotes black inferiority. And there were a lot of psychological impacts as well. The Supreme Court ruling that separate is inherently unequal. The court held the case over for a third term, third oral argument, uh, this time on the remedy. And in a really interesting um, episode in American history, uh, the, attorney, the uh, deputy attorney general writing the brief in the remedy phase of Brown II is called over to the White House. Uh, President Eisenhower would like to see the brief. And perhaps the only instance of a of a president actually editing a brief to the Supreme Court, he wrote that the psychological effects of segregation run both ways. They harm not just uh, uh, the black pupils, but reintegration could upset some settled expectations about the whites. And so it was Eisenhower who actually gave us this notion of uh, the, whatever desegregation remedy would be ordered by the court, uh, should be done with, uh, not immediately, but with all deliberate speed. And as we know from the history of segregation in public schools, all deliberate speed meant not this year, not next, not next decade, maybe not even next generation. Well, what does that lead to? Uh, segregation today, most schools have resegregated, most public schools, usually by housing patterns. Supreme Court has held that de facto segregation does not violate the Equal Protection Clause, nor can it be remedied by race conscious means. And so as schools were ordered to desegregate, a lot of schools seceded from their school districts, setting up separate school districts that would not be covered by the desegregation decrees. Also the rise of private and charter schools, uh, which uh, also would not be covered by those desegregation decrees. Uh, so the, um, uh, the resegregation of public schools in the United States uh, really follows uh, the pattern uh, that I've laid out here of secession and uh, charter and private schools. So that leads us to the question of whether Brown versus Board of Ed Education was actually a success or an abject failure. And from a functional standpoint, it seems to have been a failure. Uh, now, I wanted to focus just for a moment on school segregation in California 
Uh, the California Supreme Court was actually in the vanguard here, holding way back in 1946 uh, that uh, Westminster in Orange County, uh, its segregated schools violated both the US and the California constitutions and ordered desegregation. Uh, and then uh, more recently in the mid seventies, the Supreme Court, the California Supreme Court, again, got into the, uh, into the argument and ordered busing as a means to desegregate the public schools in Los Angeles. Uh, and some of us may recall that that uh, resulted in a uh, white flight, uh, a lot of uh, white parents taking their kids out of the public schools, putting them in private schools or moving to the suburbs uh, where they wouldn't have to worry about that. Uh, there were two important um, ballot initiatives in the wake of Crawford versus uh, uh, Los Angeles. The first is Proposition 13. Uh, we may all enjoy the fruits of that, which is to cut our property taxes, but essentially what that resulted in is the defunding of public education. I mean, after all, if you're going to take your kids out of the public schools and put them in private schools, why do you care about the funding of public education? And um, and then the following year, Proposition 1, which uh, prohibited busing uh, as a means of desegregating public schools. Both of those were upheld by the Supreme Court. As a result, the Los Angeles School District today is roughly 10% white and 90% uh, minority, uh, again, due to white flight and the advent of uh, public schools. Uh, most schools in the Los Angeles School District are predominantly single race. That includes both their pupils and their faculty. And to the extent that there are white students in Los Angeles public schools, uh, many of them are in charter or magnet schools. So Los Angeles stands as a, a rather unfortunate example of the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, we are as segregated as the Southern states ever were. All right, I mentioned I would talk about the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment, which prohibits states from denying to any person within their jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Well, what does equal protection of the laws mean? Um, well, uh, that is a question that has uh, haunted uh, legal scholars and jurists uh, uh, ever since 1868. Uh, I'm going to put them in two. I'm going to put two uh, basic categories up here, and we, we'll see if we can uh, tell the difference. The first is where you have a law that, on its face, classifies uh, and creates unequal results, such as persons in class X may vote, persons in class Y cannot. Uh, <clears throat> that is de jure discrimination, uh, unequal treatment under the law, and that is a violation of equal protection. On the other hand, laws that appear to be uniform on their face, uh, even though they produce unequal results, that's a de facto discrimination, and that is perfectly constitutional under the Equal Protection Clause. So here are a couple of examples, uh, qualifying exams, admission standards. Uh, we know, for instance, that uh, to get into the University of California, you have to have a grade point average above a 4.0. And the way to get that is by having um, uh, IB or AP classes, uh, which are generally not available in the inner city schools. So here we have a facially a neutral standard, uh, which results in it almost impossible for uh, black students to get into the University of California. Another example is you know, exclusionary zoning. A, um, a city ordinance that prohibits multifamily housing doesn't discriminate against blacks on its face, but on the other hand, um, low income folks who tend to live in multifamily as opposed to single family housing uh, are not allowed in the city uh, because of exclusionary zoning. Uh, and yet that would uh, not uh, violate the Equal Protection Clause. So these are examples of what we call de facto discrimination that are perfectly legal under the US Constitution. Uh, and that's why we see a growing wealth disparity in the, in the country, growing disparity in criminal enforcement, uh, disparity in health access and outcomes, uh, employment dis uh, disparity and discrimination, uh, housing segregation, whoops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, uh, the exclusionary zoning that I mentioned was upheld by the Supreme Court in 1975. Redlining, a practice by banks that would deny loans uh, to minority families uh, that wanted to move into uh, wide areas. And then, of course, in education and the disparity of funding, uh, California being the prime example of that. Okay, 
So here we go. Whoa. Um, I'm, uh, I hope you saw those photos. Uh, John Lewis, uh, and here's Martin Luther King. And uh, my, uh, uh, my PowerPoint slides have taken uh, control of my computer. Uh, this is Martin, Martin Luther King with his famous I Have a Dream speech at the March on Washington, August 28th, 1963. And if you look close enough, you'll see my, myself, my mother, and my grandparents in that crowd. Um, I've never actually been able to find this, but we're there someplace. OK, back to civil rights statutes and federal power over civil rights. Recall the civil rights cases of 1883. The Supreme Court held that all the laws that were then in effect were unconstitutional as beyond, beyond Congress's civil rights enforcement powers. The, um, uh, when uh, President Johnson, um, uh, in the wake of the Martin Luther King uh, March and President Kennedy's assassination, uh, proposes and then signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964, rather than relying on Congress's civil rights enforcement powers in the 14th Amendment, which you know, three generations earlier had been ruled unconstitutional, relies on the Commerce Clause. Congress has power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Do civil rights implicate interstate commerce? That is the question, okay? What's the relationship between civil rights and interstate commerce? Because that is the source of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And if there is no connection, then that act is gonna be just as unconstitutional as the 19th century acts. Well, before we answer that question, we also want to focus on the political implications of the 1964 Act. Uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, recognized that by signing the Act, the Democrats were going to lose the South, uh, just as the Republicans had 100 years earlier. Who says that history does not repeat itself? Um, and so the Democrats lost the South. Uh, well, it, with a, a very notable counterexample from uh, last month, January 6th. So what's the relationship between civil rights and interstate commerce? Here is a uh, picture of the Boston Red Stockings professional baseball team in 1871. Um, you know, nicely mustached uh, and of course all white as major leagues were. Uh, the Red Stockings moved to Milwaukee in, in 1953 and changed their name uh, to the Braves. And uh, you may notice that there are a few black players on that team. Of course, they couldn't play any games in the Southern states. Well, there were no Southern uh, baseball teams. In fact, no professional sports at all in the Southern states, zero, uh, because of the uh, Jim Crow laws. Um, so this is what Archibald Cox argued to the Supreme Court uh, when the Supreme Court heard uh, the constitutional challenge to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. He recited uh, the Negro Motorists Green Book, uh, which was the AAA book or AAA-like book uh, that black, uh, uh, black folks would use as a guide to where they, could, uh, uh, where they could stay, where they could eat, where they could use restroom facilities if they were traveling through the South. Uh, they made a movie out of it, which many of you have seen, uh, with Viggo Mortensen and Marshali Ali, uh, which was pretty true uh, to uh, the situation uh, that was um, uh, extant in the South uh, during this period. And this is what uh, Archibald Cox uh, argued to the Supreme Court, the relationship between interstate commerce and civil rights uh, because of the Jim Crow laws and the black codes that were uh, extant in the, in the South, the Southern economy would re remain stagnant and dormant uh, as it had for generations. The Supreme Court upholds the Civil Rights Act of 1964 based on the Commerce Clause and based on um, Cox's magnificent argument. And what happened? Well, immediately after that, the Milwaukee Braves moved to Atlanta, the first professional sports team in the South. And now, of course, the South dominates baseball, football, basketball, you name it. I just wanted to have a shout out to uh, Hank Aaron, who was not only one of the greatest uh, uh, baseball players of all time, but also a civil rights icon and uh, what a great loss of losing him last month. Okay, so here's the Civil Rights Act of 64. Uh, 
picture of uh, Lyndon Johnson signing it. Uh, you may recognize a couple of the folks standing behind him, Everett Dirksen on the left, Hubert Humphrey on the right. Uh, there, here are the major provisions of the Civil Rights Act. Um, uh, public accommodations, which is what uh, uh, the Supreme Court upheld. Uh, well, it upheld all of this. Uh, and Title VII, uh, equal uh, employment rights. Uh, so the Civil Rights Act of 64 is still the basic source of civil rights at the federal level in the United States at this time. Um, it didn't go very far with voting rights. And so the following year, we had a new statute, the Voting Rights, rights Act of 1965. Uh, the principal provisions of that, uh, and by the way, this is passed under the 15th Amendments, under Congress's enforcement power of the 15th Amendment. It prohibits voting restrictions based on race, gives the Attorney General the right to sue to enforce uh, the 15th Amendment. Uh, it designates states and jurisdictions that have a history of discriminating in voting and says to those jurisdictions, you cannot change your voting rules without getting approval from the Justice Department, what's known as pre-clearance. In a 2013 case known as Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court held that Section 4 was unconstitutional because it did not treat the states equally. We have to be just as respectful of the Southern states that have been discriminating for hundreds of years against blacks and denying them voting rights for centuries. We have to be just as respectful of them as we are of the Northern states and therefore singling out states for uh, extra burdens or requirements was unconstitutional. Section four <clears throat> was eliminated uh, the pre-clearance requirement of Section 5 it becomes uh, a nullity at that point. <clears throat> and if um, the Justice Department uh, declines to enforce um, the 15th Amendment, as it has, uh, then the Voting Rights Act essentially is impotent. Hopefully, uh, the Biden administration will change that and figure out some way uh, to get uh, to reinvigorate uh, the Voting Rights Act. In the, in the wake of Shelby County, just in the last eight years, uh, we've seen uh, all sorts of uh, creative efforts to suppress black voters. Uh, that would include <coughs> purges of voter rolls, the reinstitution of poll taxes, uh, photo ID requirements, a gerrymandering of congressional districts. Uh, that's why the census has become so important. The mass incarceration, as you learned in uh, a, a previous lecture of, of, of blacks and minorities, and their subsequent disenfranchisement, their inability to vote. Uh, limits on voting by mail and early access. Uh, you may have read that um, the Republicans in Georgia um, reeling from their losses, both at the top and the uh, down ticket races, uh, want to uh, uh, eliminate voting by mail uh, for 2022. So that's uh, just another instance of uh, voter suppression. A strict signature match and even witness requirements when you send in a mail ballot. Shorter voting hours. Can you believe that uh, we vote on a Tuesday in this country on a work day? Uh, reducing the number of polling places and drop boxes. Uh, strict residency requirements for college students. And Trump lawsuits challenging the election results. The Supreme Court has upheld uh, almost all of those except the Trump lawsuits, which is why I guess um, Joseph R. Biden Jr. is president of the United States. However, the biggest voter suppression technique hasn't actually been uh, raised in the courts. And that is the messaging and intimidation, mostly in social media. Uh, I think we can all thank uh, Mark Zuckerberg for giving us uh, Donald Trump in 2016. And, uh, you know, despite some uh, recent uh, efforts to contain misinformation and voter intimidation and, and messaging, uh, I think uh, the tech giants will continue to do that. After all, they make a lot of money doing that. Uh, there's also the voter voting rights, I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1968, uh, which uh, uh, makes it a crime uh, or augments the penalties for hate crimes. Uh, the Indian Civil Rights per provision, but the one that we're most familiar with is the Fair Housing Act, Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, which prohibits uh, discrimination in sales or rentals based on protected status, uh, disability, 
families with children. Notably, it does not cover LBGTQ uh, applicants from being discriminated against in either the sale or rental of housing, except in federally assisted programs. Uh, uh, the um, uh, HUD has uh, done that by regulation, but it's not part of the statute itself. Uh, and then finally, Title IX, uh, which is uh, the uh, the uh, Education Amendments Act of 1972, uh, which prohibits sex discrimination in educational programs that are funded by uh, or with the assistance of the federal government. Uh, so sex discrimination uh, in education, Title IX, a very important tool uh, for civil rights. Um, what about the Equal Rights Amendment, the actual constitutional amendment of 1972? Uh, that would have prohibited as a constitutional matter, not just as a statutory matter, the um, uh, di discrimination in any form uh, against persons on the basis of sex. Uh, well, it did not get its uh, 38th vote, the three quarters required by the 1979 deadline. Last year, in 2020, Virginia became the 38th state, but Congress had set a deadline of 1979. So uh, there are a number of cases pending uh, challenging uh, whether the Equal Rights Amendment uh, has become or has been ratified and become part of the Constitution. Anyway, uh, other than um, um, PowerPoint taking over my computer uh, during today's session, I, I want to thank you for inviting me to celebrate uh, Black History Month with you. And at that point, I will turn everything back to Suzanne. And I have to stop sharing, and there we go. And you're... Well, thank you for a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure our viewers learned a great deal. Um, we do have a, a bit of time left, perhaps a little bit more than I anticipated. That was a, a whirlwind tour. Uh, so, uh, perhaps, uh, let me see how how well we might be able to ad lib this. And um, what I'd really like to turn, turn the discussion to, perhaps both legally and politically, if we have the time, um, is, is the matter of police misconduct, uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. And, um, and the question which uh, came up in our previous broadcast uh, on Black History Month, and that has to do with uh, looking forward uh, what kinds of changes, if any, given the one step, uh, two steps forward, one step back history that you so beautifully outlined. Uh, perhaps you could talk to us uh, first, maybe legally and second, uh, politically. Um, what do you see as uh, the future uh, in terms of restraining, uh, turning around uh, uh, police abuse, police murder of uh, unarmed people, particularly Blacks, but not actually exclusively Blacks? Um, where do you come down on that? Optimistic or pessimistic? And uh, particularly, let's start with legal, with legal remedies. Sure. Well, that is a course unto itself, uh, which I used to teach. But um, uh, let me try to uh, give you a, uh, a succinct uh, and short answer to that. Uh, so police misconduct is essentially a battery. Uh, it's a tort. Uh, and like most torts, uh, th these are typically covered under state law. So if um, the police um, uh, use excessive force, uh, or, um, uh, or chokeholds or what have you uh, against uh, citizens, uh, then those are torts that would uh, be tried in a state court, uh, at least nominally. Uh, but most state laws give uh, the police immunity uh, from those kinds of lawsuits. So state law is not an effective uh, route to pursue in the vast majority of police uh, misconduct and abuse cases. So we have to turn to federal law. Um, and so what federal law is there? Well, uh, there is the 14th Amendment itself. Uh, so I, one level, um, uh, choking somebody or uh, kneeling on them uh, or, um, uh, or shooting them uh, is a denial of due process, uh, which is covered by uh, the 14th Amendment. Uh, 
And the way the 14th Amendment could be enforced is either through the Attorney General's office, uh, the U.S. Attorney General's office, uh, they could bring uh, a variety of charges uh, or including uh, up to uh, including uh, criminal charges against offending off okay. and the victims of police abuse. Uh, they would have to rely on that statute I mentioned, Section 1983. Uh, which is uh, one of the few re uh, surviving uh, measures from the 19th century Civil Rights Acts. Uh, it's been reenacted. Uh, and, um, and what that does is it allows someone to seek uh, a remedy against uh, a state or local official for the violation of civil rights. So, so excessive um, uh, force, uh, police misconduct, police brutality, these are all violations of the Due Process Clause. And I would bring a Section 1983 clause of action against the officers uh, to seek damages uh, for the violation of my civil rights. Uh, and uh, now there's a, a couple of things that make that a remedy uh, uh, almost ineffective. Uh, one is that the Supreme Court has read a qualified immunity into Section 1983. It's not there in the statute. Uh, but remember, <clears throat> the Supreme Court has retarded for most of our history um, <clears throat> the progress and the enforcement of civil rights. And this is one way they have done that. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, a, um, a police officer would not be subject to 1983 remedies unless they violated clearly established law, uh, which means they've done something that's almost identical to uh, something that has been found to be illegal uh, by a published court opinion uh, prior to the police officer's action. It's really hard to get around the qualified immunity of the police. Extraordinarily hard. They have to do something that's almost identical to something that's been punished before. It, even a little change in the facts uh, allows them to uh, assert qualified immunity. And qualified immunity is not simply immunity from having to pay damages, it's an immunity from having to go to trial. So that uh, gets asserted at the, off, at the outset of any case, uh, and it can be appealed all the way up even before any facts are presented. Uh, can I ask you so, a question about that? Yeah. Um, so uh, when the Supreme Court made this decision, um, were, were the justices uh, uh, consciously aware? Would you say this was a deliberate attempt uh, to impede uh, uh, the, uh, the prosecution of, of police or was it in some other context and this was an unanticipated consequence? No, it's not unanticipated at all. And it's not specific to police abuses. Uh, it's any 1983 case against any state or local official it can be asserted by the school teacher who uh, you know, uh, abuses a child. Uh, it can be asserted uh, against the city ma uh, manager who is, um, you know, uh, ratifying redlining? It can be in, in any uh, civil rights case. Uh, the uh, defendant either has absolute immunity, and those are a few cases. Uh, judges have absolute immunity. Uh, everybody else has qualified immunity, and the Supreme Court is quite uh, intentional about what that means. Uh, what that means is that they have freedom to operate and they have freedom to uh, continue unconstitutional action unless it's on all fours, like something that has previously been ruled unconstitutional or, or illegal. And the second thing that makes police abuse cases uh, difficult to bring is that even when you win and you recover damages, uh, members of the police force are in, uh, indemnified uh, by their employer. And so the money that never comes out of their pocket uh, which means that they don't have that personal responsibility incentive to obey the law because it's like having insurance. Uh, you know, if you're careless in your house and you uh, and your house burns down, well, I don't have to pay for it. The insurance company pays for it. Uh, in economics, that's known as moral hazard. Um, and so that <clears throat> is certainly the case uh, with um, the police uh, because individual police officers never pay Damages or damage awards that are given against them, and by the way, uh, when the damage award is against the municipality itself or the police department itself for improper training 
of their police officers or having a, a pattern and practice of abuses. LA County and LA City uh, are notable, are notorious uh, for that. Um, and they have to pay the damages. Uh, but they, what, what does that mean? It means the taxpayers are paying it, right? Um, and they're, they're paying it through higher taxes. Just think of all those uh, additional cents on your sales tax that are really going to pay the damage awards against the cities. Uh, or reduce municipal services elsewhere because the city is, has to set aside a large percentage of its budget to pay these 1983 claims. Um, so again, the incentive through civil litigation against individual police or individual um, um, municipal employees is really not there. And uh, it's also really not there uh, or there to a much lesser extent uh, when you're suing the uh, department or the city itself. So civil litigation has proved to be an uh, ineffective way to bring about police reform. Um, and so that gets you to the political remedies. Um, and those political remedies uh, have gone just in the wrong direction for the last four years. Uh, we're hoping that they will um, start getting righted under the Biden administration, who has made it a, 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 an important element, both of his campaign and of his early presidency, uh, to try to uh, undertake some really meaningful police reform. That may be through a, one of several federal mechanisms. It could be through federal funding, because local police departments, just like any other local agency, schools, for instance, receive a good chunk of their funding uh, from the federal government. And if that funding is uh, withdrawn uh, on the basis of police mis misconduct, we might see um, the police department starting to uh, right themselves. Uh, it could be through prosecutions, uh, as we see in the George Floyd case, uh, criminal prosecutions. Um, and it could be through legislation, although I'm not sure we'll get much legislation uh, through the Senate uh, you know, at the current time. But I, I think any... Um, uh, any real, really meaningful action is going to have to come through the federal government at this point. Um, can, can I just follow up? Uh, so when you say that, that criminal prosecutions uh, might, might, might be mounted, I'm a little confused. Uh, what, does this mean then that, that some states would have, have the jurisdiction? I'm, I've always been mystified. It seems to me somebody says, well, I feared for my life, uh, and there's no way you can prove that, that that's uh, incorrect. Uh, and so in a sense, it's, uh, it's not uh, prosecutable. C could you enlighten me there, please? Well, sure. We don't see a lot of criminal prosecutions against m police misconduct. Um, you know, the George Floyd case was an example, but there are a lot of counterexamples like Breonna Taylor. You know, these folks are not being prosecuted at all. Where would these prosecutions be coming from? Well, they could be coming from state officials, uh, as, as in the case of uh, George Floyd. So um, uh, that is a, um, uh, that's a Minnesota a state prosecution uh, that is uh, occurring. Uh, but it could also come through the federal government. Uh, so <clears throat> if you can hearken back a, a, a generation to Rodney King, uh, when he was beaten by LAPD officers, uh, there was first a state prosecution, criminal prosecution, and the officers were exonerated. Uh, they were acquitted. And then there was a civil rights prosecution by the federal U.S. Department of Justice, and there they were convicted. Uh, so uh, there are two different jurisdictions, state and federal. The double jeopardy clause does not apply uh, when you're talking about different jurisdictions. And therefore, it... Um, it, it's up to state authorities, uh, and you know, and de depending on where they are, they may take civil rights uh, seriously or not. But it ultimately is going to depend upon the uh, U.S. Department of Justice uh, through their guidelines, through their funding, and through their own criminal prosecutions of um, of errant police. All right, fine. Well, we certainly appreciate your illuminating us a bit on this point. And uh, I believe we are about out of time. So I wanna thank Professor Mannheim for his colorful and clear review of black history and for his comments about the present dilemmas that we face.
And I want to thank you, our audience, for listening to this program. I'm sure you learned a lot. Please plan to make time for Concerned Citizens Presents next time.